and then look back at me and try to hold it. <laughs> Portion of this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We're currently in the countryside of Japan in the Niigata Prefecture, doing a little bit of a promo tourism video for them with the Sony FX30, and we figured we'll share our experience using this camera with you guys along the way. Now, most people who tend to visit Japan go to Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. You know, the more well-known spots of Japan. But Niigata, I would say it's the more hidden part of Japan. You still get the tranquil shrines, the relaxing hot springs, the excellent customer services. But you will also get some of the best craftsmanship of any type of kitchenware, Smile. the birthplace of multicolored koi fish, and for my uh, wine enthusiast, copious top-notch sake that you can sample on one place as Niigata is home to roughly 90 breweries. Now, to capture all of these attractions, I have with me the FX30 and the A7R5. And one of my coordinators, Derek, will be shooting with the A1 and the DJI Mavic Air 2, but I will primarily be using the FX30, and 90% of the final video, which you will see at the end, contains footage from the FX30. And that's because I really want to push the limit of this high-end APS-C cinema camera. The State of APS-C over the last few years, Sony APS-C has been getting sidelined, and that's because Sony full-frame cameras have gone a lot more affordable, therefore more accessible. Full-frame boasts sensor advantages such as better low-light performance, and depending on the lens, yields a blurrier background, the bokeh. Not to mention in the case of Sony full-frame cameras, we get more high-end settings like 4K60, 4K120, more bitrate options, full-size HDMI, better heat dissipation, bigger battery, clear LCD screen, the list goes on. On. However, I always argue that full frame ecosystem winds up getting costly in the long run, and again, depending on the lens, might make the overall setup bigger and heavier and more expensive. It's more worth it if you are a dedicated professional or someone who actively uses the gear, but if you're just starting out or even if you're well seasoned and are looking for a very capable compact setup that appeases your eyes without breaking your back and wallet, APS-C comes in with advantages in pricing and sizing. Price. The FX30 is 1800 US dollars a body only, roughly half the cost of its full frame brother, the FX3. While more affordable is subjective, for what you're getting, a high-end APS-C cinema camera with all the best features of a full frame FX3, minus the sensor, of course, you're getting a whopping deal for the next few years. And in time, it will come even lower in price for even more people to hop on the cinema train. Form factor. Now, I'm sure I'm already getting in the comments. The FX30 and the FX3 are nearly identical in size and weight. What do you mean it's smaller and lighter? Yes, the bodies are roughly the same, but the beauty lies in the lightweight APS-C lenses. You see, the FX3 actually can't take full advantage of APS-C lenses at least not in 4K without using the clear image zoom trick, but then you lose all of your best autofocus features. Whereas the FX30, you can use both full frame and APS-C lenses while retaining all of the best features. And when you use small APS-C lenses, the entire setup becomes incredibly small. So small that you become a fly on the wall. Now, Niigata is really known for their excellent craftsmanship. If you're into cooking or camping, you can get some really nice cutleries here knives and other utensils, or even incredibly lightweight travel-sized pots and pans. And they make all of this in-house. We are at Tojiro Knife Factory. We're gonna get some behind the scenes of how knives are made. Okay. During the tours of some of the factories and forgeries of Niigata, my own compact setup allows me to be discreet and not to disturb the workers. I'm getting their natural actions as they go through their process because they don't notice that I'm there. I'm not intimidating at all. I'm not coming in with a giant film crew. I'm just a guy with his widow camera. But I am getting pro-like results. Now, I love using the FX30 and some of the wider lenses on the gimbal. I don't get fatigued as quickly. I can go on all day long. Very compact for a 
nice mobile cinematic setup. Here I am using the Zhuyun Crane M3 and I'm getting my favorite push-in shots, particularly at the Rankai So Ryokan, a traditional Japanese inn with hot spring baths. And get some really nice compact mobile cinematic shots. That made absolutely no sense, but wow. And I'm getting some real estate shots with the 10 to 20 power zoom of the bathhouses. Lenses and Ibis. So let's talk about the specific lenses that I brought with me. For this trip, I got the recent Sony APS-C lens trios, the 10 to 20 power zoom, the 11 f 1.8, my personal favorite, and the 15 millimeter f 1.4. And for the zooms, we got the 16 to 55 f 2.8 and the 70 to 350 telephoto zoom lens. Now, of course, you don't have to exclusively use Sony lenses. There are a lot of third party offerings out there, some with unique characteristics and some at a lot more affordable pricing. My favorite from last year was the Sigma 18 to 50 f 2.8. And I can just imagine that lens with the FX 30, that combination right there is mm, so good. But what you will notice is that a lot of these lenses don't have lens stabilization. And that's fine for the most part. For Sony full frame cameras, they have really good in body stabilization. Sony APS-C on the other hand, only the A66 and A6500 have Ibis. Ibis. Back, the rest either lacks it completely or uses electronic image stabilization, which I am not a fan of. FX30 though, Yes, in-body image stabilization, it has it, which I personally find almost just as good as some of the full-frame cameras that I use. When I'm not using the gimbal, I'm handheld most of the time, and the footage is quite stable. If I needed extra stability, we have the active stabilization feature, which crops in 10% of your frame, but a small price to pay, in my opinion. The sensor that the FX30 uses is technically shooting 6K, but downsampling to 4K, so you're getting extra crispy results. So that 10% of a crop for active stabilization for that smoother shot, totally worth it. Rolling shutter in 4K. Rolling shutter in 4K, while it's still present in the FX30, is actually quite, quite, quite minimal. It's a lot better than what you would previously find in the other Sony APS-C cameras. Compromises. While we're talking about compromises, APS-C sensor is smaller than a full frame sensor. People will immediately think, bokeh, low light. Yes, APS-C is weaker than full frame, but I'd argue if you know what you're doing, you're using the right gear, you will yield results that rival full frame. Plus, bokeh isn't everything. Getting the blurriest of blurry background doesn't make you a better storyteller. But if you do really need distinctive separation between subject and background, there are plenty of f1.4 lenses to choose from. Like the new 15mm f1.4 from Sony, or even the popular Sigma trios, 16, 30, and 56 f1.4. Very, very solid choices. Those will definitely come in handy in low light situations. But another way to deal with low light is to shoot in S-Log3. With the FX30, you have two base ISO that gives you the full 15 plus stop of dynamic range, 800 and 2500. Now it's important to shoot in one of those two and not the numbers in between as you will lose dynamic range and introduce more grain and noise into your footage. For example, it's better to shoot in 2500 than it is to shoot at 2000 because at 2500, your second base ISO kicks in and gives you a cleaner image. Now on the flip side, if you're just bumping from 800 to 1600, you can largely get away with it. I'm just more talking about you're literally that close to the next cleaner ISO, you might as well just bump to it, right? But if you're just like, eh, you're not even that close to it, but you just need that extra bit of kick of light, yeah, you can go in between the ISO, no problem. Now for this dark scene right here at the Kyotsu Gorge Tunnel, I want to preserve a lot of my highlight and shadow details, so I switch to S-Log3. That said, I have pushed up to 6400 ISO and at times 12800 with no picture profile, and the results are usable, in my Vong opinion. May not be the right opinion, but at least it's the Vong opinion. So a lot of what you're seeing, aside from the very contrasty, tricky scenes, are shot with no picture profile. 
standard creative style. And I think it looks great. It's the style that I've been filming for for years now, and we're getting some of the best Sony colors in recent years. Less of that greenish tint that you might have found in the older A6000 and A7 series cameras. The skin tones that come off of this just looks fantastic. And the footage off the FX30 matches up quite well with the A7R5 and the A1, making it great to serve as a B, C, or D camera for both the A7R5 and the A1, and even the FX3 and the A7S3. So that makes it a pretty dang good B, C, D, E, F, G camera for your FX3 and your A7S3 as well. Reminiscent of the A6500. And you know something? This makes me very reminiscent of my A6500 days. It's an ancient camera now, came out in late 2016. I know, that's considered ancient. But at that point in time, it was my daily driver, beating out a lot of the full frame cameras at the time, including the one that I was using, the A7R2. Mainly in video features, of course. So the fact that I'm using the best APS-C camera right now with the latest A7R camera during this project, <laughs> just really brought me back. You know, it's crazy to see how far we've come between the 6500 and the FX30. The difference between then and now is that we can shoot 4K 60p, finally, even 4K 120p. We have a really high resolution flip out screen, full size HDMI, bigger battery, dual car slots, better IBIS, just all the things that we really love in the high end full frame cameras, finally being brought down to APS-C. And I would even argue that the FX30 even trumps some of the current full frame offerings, like the A7C and the A7 III. And it can even beat out the A7 IV and this A7R5 in some regards. Improvements over the years. So let's go ahead and talk about the improvements over the years between the A6000 series camera and the FX30. We have the flip out screen. I know it's nothing new in the realms of APS-C. The ZV-10 already has it, but unfortunately what that camera offers just isn't substantial enough for a lot of APS-C users to sidestep over because APS-C users are looking for upgrades. And this screen on the FX30 is nice, bright, and most importantly, clear. In some of these footage here, you see that I'm using the Xperia Pro phone as a monitor, but it's mainly to record the UI. When I'm not using the monitor, the LCD screen on the FX30 is sharp. I can tell when things are or are not in focus, especially when we need to do the detail shots of the knives. I like to use the touch focus to set my focus and then turn off autofocus to lock it in and just let the scene do its thing. But the autofocus tracking on this camera is fantastic. We got animal and bird autofocus in video mode here. And we stop by this canal filled with ducks, geese, and swans, and I have my 70 to 350 on, and I just track the birds as they flew by. Ooh, battery. So it uses the bigger Z batteries. Every day is a long shoot. I'd say we would film from morning till dinner time. I brought a lot of batteries with us just because we are rolling three cameras. But I would say the frequency for me to change out for the FX30 specifically, I'd say probably at least three times per day, which is not bad at all. And no, I did not experience any overheating with the FX30. It does have a fan to help circulate the heat better. It's pretty quiet and it only goes on when you're not recording. Oh man, just using this and seeing all the improvements make me really happy for APS-C users. However, does this mean you should jump ship to the FX30? Let's talk. Transitioning from alpha to FX. Now, for clarity's sake, when Sony uses the term alpha in their marketing, alpha. it generally encompasses the FX line as well. They too have the alpha logo branded on them. But in this particular section of this video, when I'm referring to alpha, alpha. it means A7 and A6000 series cameras. A7 and A6000 series cameras. So if you're coming from alpha series and jumping into FX series, it's gonna feel pretty jarring. And I'm not talking about the new menu system, right? That's fantastic and more in line with the recent Alpha Series cameras. They actually share pretty much the same menu UI system. I'm more talking about the button layouts. A lot of the labels are adopted from their cinema cameras like the FX9 and the FX6. So you would see words like peaking, zebra, shutter, iris. Whereas Alpha, they're not too strictly labeled. 
So in that regards, it might feel like you're using an entirely different camera. You might feel the sense to adhere to what the labels dictate. But know this, you can customize and make it function more like one of your Alpha Series cameras, especially if you're like me, incredibly reliant on muscle memory to access our most used feature. I would suggest getting a label maker and relabeling some of the text on the camera. Might be a bit extreme, but my point is the buttons are fully customizable. All right. Aside from the shell being different, a lot of the internals are practically Alpha Series. Best example I can give is the FX3 and the A7S3. Now both of those produce the same image quality, performs roughly the same in low light because they're the same sensor, same processor, same formats. And even if it's not exactly the same, then it's almost identical. So then what makes the FX30 a cinema camera? Does it shoot in a special sauce that automatically makes it cinematic? Well, the answer is no, but it does have features that aid specifically in the cinematic process, if that makes any sense. For example, I believe we have six quarter inch screw holes around the camera for more versatile rigging solutions like on a car or on a drone, or simply just add different attachments onto the camera without needing to use a full cage if you don't want to. We have the ability to import custom user LEDs so we can use whatever look we like, and we can have the option to bake that look into the footage for faster post workflow. Personally, I don't take advantage of this feature as I, you know, prefer the no picture profile look. And unlike previous Sony APS-C cameras, the FX30 can shoot in 10 bit 422, which gives us more data to work with in post for color grading. But by far, the most important feature is the Cine EI mode. This is probably one of the best ways to shoot S-Log3, but it does have a bit of a learning curve. So if you're serious about getting into the professional cinematography space, you're gonna be getting some really good hands-on experience with this budget cinema camera. Basically, Cine EI shoots at either two of the cleanest ISOs, 800 or 2500, either labeled low or high. And you don't have to worry about shooting anything in between because they just completely take all those options out for you. However, this Cine EI mode is probably the best if you are filming in a controlled environment, i.e. film sets where you can adjust the practical lights. You can add light, take away light, screw on ND filters, screw off ND filters. But if you will be filming outside a lot like I do, where you're very reliant on natural lighting or available ambient lighting, then it gets pretty tricky if you try to shoot in Cine EI. Shooting in two ISOs only can be very limiting. If the sun outside just moves literally one inch, well then that's a difference between adding and losing a stop of light. Shooting at ISO 800 would be too dark and then maybe shooting ISO at 2500 would be too bright. So as you can see, it's not very ideal for running gun style videos. But that's the beauty of this camera, right? It's very adaptive to any sort of situation, whether you're just producing a quick video on YouTube or you're a huge YouTube creator, or you're trying to be a professional DP with full control of their lighting or colors, or you can be as run and gun as a documentary filmmaker. Personally. Will I get the FX30? I'll say this. There was a point in time where I heavily considered trading out my A7S III for the FX3. Ergonomic-wise, the FX3 just seems more fitting for our style of run-and-gun digital nomad YouTube content creation lifestyle. But the one thing that stopped me was the fact that the FX3 does not have an electronic viewfinder. You see, when we're out and about dealing with tricky lighting scenes, it's sometimes hard to see what's on the screen even if we amp up the monitor brightness to sunny weather. Having an electronic viewfinder on the A7S III allows us to block off the external light to see the image clearly, and I don't think that's something that we can give up. I'm using the A7S III right now, so I can't really demo with the A7S III. Now, if Sony were to, say, release an external electronic viewfinder attachment or even make a current one that they have to work with the FX series, then it would be a high consideration. Oh, and the FX3 does not have a mechanical shutter. I value hybrid capabilities of a camera, and while the FX30 can take photos, the lack of a mechanical shutter will at times yield unfavorable results. Again, I just really enjoy the overall compact setup of the APS-C ecosystem, and I will personally wait for the next A6000 or ZV series camera with some of the features that we've been seeing on the FX30. Now, I doubt the 6000 and the ZV series would get 4K 120, but I'm hoping at least we will get 4K 60p. Otherwise, I'd be very disappointed. But that's just me. For folks who are looking for a dedicated, capable, cinematic camera on the budget, 
as it stands right now with what it's offering, the FX30 easily gonna be one of the top best cinematic cameras to get for the next few years. But until then, here's the final video that we filmed for Nigata on the FX30. Roll it! Many who visit Japan often come to Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, and they're absolutely stunning for first timers. But if you're on your second or third trip to Japan, or simply want a fresh take on the country, consider Niigata. Just roughly two hours away from Tokyo by bullet train, you still get the tranquil shrines, the relaxing hot spring baths, and the amazing Japanese hospitality. But what you'll also find are some of the best metalworks craftsmanships, the birthplace of koi fish, and as well as many top-notch sake that you can sample all at once. Our first stop brings us to the artisan area of Tsubame Sanjo, where, at Santoku's special cast company, we get an exclusive look at how some of the lightest cast iron pots and pans get made. It's almost like we're staring into a volcano. Next up, we experience what it's like to turn this nail into a small knife at the Sanjo Blacksmith Dojo, where we get to train with an artisan that has well over 70 years of experience. The blacksmiths here take their craft very seriously, so they make sure you leave with a knife that's up to their standards, that's worth carrying their name. Now, if you're into cooking and are looking to pick up a new kitchen knife or kitchen cutlery, definitely stop by Tojiro Open Factory. While you're at it, they also have a tour that goes through their step-by-step -step process to their manufacturing. From pressing to welding to grinding to polishing, you get to see what goes into making a knife from start to finish. <sighs> After a day of factory tours, make sure to stop by Ponshukan, a facility within the Niigata Station, where you can drink all the sake that this prefecture has to offer. For one of our stays, we got to visit Rankeso, a 100-year-old Japanese inn that is a cultural heritage site of Japan, with both indoor and outdoor hot spring baths with a fantastic forest and river view. What makes Rankeso Onsen unique is that they also welcome guests with tattoos, something that is uncommon in many traditional bathhouses in Japan. Rankeso is proud of their bath water, as it comes from natural sodium mineral spring water that helps give a silky smooth skin. And they encourage guests to drink the onsen water in their lobby. Mmm, kind of tastes like soup. Another fun experience in Niigata is to visit the birthplace of multicolored koi fish in Ogia City. Not only that, but you also get to feed and pet them at Nishi Kogoi no Sato, one of the koi fish farms in this area. Be gentle though, as some of these koi fish can go well over $10,000. Although they bite, it won't hurt, because koi fish don't have teeth. <laughs> On the last day of our trip, we visit the artistic side of Niigata in Tokamachi, the Monet Museum, and Kyotsu Gorge Tunnel. All the art pieces here tie into Niigata Prefecture and take inspiration from the area. And they are very transformative, taking everyday scraps and turning them into something out of the ordinary. Very much like how artisans transform metal scraps into everyday tools. The artistic nature of Niigata truly has no bounds. By the end of it all, we definitely have a newfound appreciation in the everyday objects we use. And I gotta say, Niigata in the snow? Incredibly beautiful. Bummer we didn't have a chance to head up the ski slopes this time, but that just means we'll have to return again soon. For your own personalized trip to Niigata, definitely get in contact with the Hidden Japan. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. If you guys enjoy this video and want to support the channel, you can say so via a super thanks, or simply stick around and listen to what my sponsor Squarespace has to say. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to create beautiful websites. You don't need any coding knowledge whatsoever. Simply just choose from their many easy-to-use templates. Perfect for people like us who want to focus on our travels and make YouTube videos for you guys, but still want a presentable website for brands that are looking to work with us. Whether you're building your own photography portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a landing page for your business, design it with Squarespace. Get a 14-day trial with my link below and try it for yourself. When you're ready to launch, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain with my code, Jason Vaughn. Thanks for listening and supporting the channel, and we'll catch you guys in our next Japan adventure.
Peace. Let's go. Well, hello there, hybrid shooters. You know, on this channel, we do a lot of camera-related reviews, right? Producing countless photo and video tutorials on top of that. And to get these amazing and unique samples, you know we do a lot of traveling. Lots of traveling. But what you don't know is the pain and suffering that goes on during those travels. Well, that is about to change. So join us as we battle against the crowds, the clouds, and the cows in our brand new photography mini series, Travel Gone Vong. Travel Gone Vong. Jesus, bring it down. Oh no. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Is this rolling shutter? Or is it just a wave? Rolling shutter is like this.